Manifest Telecast has preempted its Israel programs that we bring every week to present to you three weeks of special prophetic updates. My first update deals with the coronavirus, which has affected the entire world and actually sent shockwaves into the travel industry and, of course, other industries as well. What I would like to propose to you today is to consider the coronavirus a pestilence that is maybe alluded to in Matthew chapter 24. The disciples came to Jesus and asked him, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus then begins to tell them that there'll be wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilences in diverse places. And then he says, all of these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, if we look at this, I want you, you to notice Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, which is extremely interesting because here it says famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Now, notice this, that the meaning of each of these is very interesting. A famine is actually due to a, a, a lack of rain, perhaps, and uh, creates a food shortage. The word earthquakes is the Greek word seismos, and they can happen on the land and the sea. On the land, we know what they are. We've seen them throughout history. When it happens under the water, it creates a tsunami. And so in Luke chapter 21, 25, it says that in the last days, the sea and the waves would be roaring. And those that have survived tsunamis will tell you that they hear an echo or a roaring that comes from the sea before the waves come crashing in. Now, the other word that I want to key up on is the word pestilences. And so this is a plague of some sort, but in Greek it can mean a plague that ends in death. Now, notice the following. This, these are three points I want to make, actually four. Number one, each word or sign is in the plural. It has an S at the end, meaning multiples, earthquakes, pestilences, and that type of thing, famines with an S, meaning many. Number two, all of these are said to be, according to Jesus, in diverse places, or we would say in modern English, in different places. So you have times when these three things Im impact one particular area of the world or another particular area of the world. Point three, all three of these seem to follow in an order. First, there's a famine. Then there's a pestilence, and then you will see an earthquake. In, in Greek, a lot of times, my Greek scholars tell me that some things are listed in an actual order of either the significant part first, or at uh, other times, uh, the, when you say, if you look at Matthew chapter 24, for example, that is like an order of what would, what would happen, the actual order of the event. Number four, point four, all three of these are not the end but the beginning of sorrows. In Matthew 24, verse 8, Jesus said, all of these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, earthquakes will accompany this pestilence that we now see called coronavirus. And I can go ahead and predict that based on Matthew chapter 24. So in the midst of all of this activity that's happening globally, you're going to start seeing earthquakes in just different places. And I feel like in my spirit, you're going to see them come in places that normally do not experience them. Now, I want you to look at the word pestilence in Scripture and uh, very carefully. In Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 25, it says there will be pestilences in the cities. And in, in the Hebrew, it means a destroying pestilence. In Leviticus 26 and 33, it says that cities would be laid to waste. In other words, it, it, the implication there is cities are going to be empty. We would say laid to waste or empty. Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 22, and this is very interesting, it says this, Watch this verse. Your highways will be desolate. Now, outside of the United States, you have seen where they have shut down, for example, in Italy and parts of South Korea, entire towns and cities. And you look at the pictures, no one's on the highway. You look at the pictures and no one is on the streets. Now, it's important to understand that in the Levitical law of God, and remember this, the laws of God never change. There's the moral law, the social law, the judicial law. Even though Jesus came to fulfill the law, he came to fulfill the symbolism and the feast and the Sabbaths and the new moons and all those things that are found in the Old Testament. But when he came, he fulfilled it. Now, many people in the Western world believe that Jesus did away with the Old Testament. Absolutely not true. Now, I can't get onto that because I'd be sidetracked. But what I want to share with you is simply this, that in those Leviticus and Deuteronomy scriptures, God says this, you will not hearken to my word. You will not obey my commandments. 
you will not do what I've told you to do. Therefore, I'm going to lift your hedge of protection and allow these things to come upon you. And it really looks like that we're seeing part of that. Now, I'm not going to get into this in detail on this particular program, but the United States of America, including our Supreme Court, has made decisions where they've legalized biblical abominations and they made them legal. Also, when millions and millions, literally tens of millions of infants have been aborted in the womb, it's called the shedding of innocent blood. And Matthew 23 says the cities will become cursed. You know, this is the point I want to make as it relates to the Torah or the five books of Moses and the warnings. Those warnings are still in existence today. In other words, if we don't obey the judicial, social, moral law of God, there will be consequences. And you can read about that in the apocalypse and also in Romans chapter one. Now let's talk about this virus for a moment because it's very, very intriguing of where it began. There's still questions about this. We do know according to researchers that it began in China, but how did it begin? There's two theories. One is that an animal was infected with it and was sold at a market and someone ate it, and that was ground zero for this particular virus called the coronavirus. Now, it's interesting that in those markets, they sell rats or monkeys and sometimes snakes. And uh, some of these animals are what's called non-kosher. In other words, God forbid you to eat them, but he did that for a particular reason. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out, and we're not going to spend all the time on trying to figure out where it or how it started, but we do know it started in China. And the suggestion is an animal, uh, they call it exotic animal, a rat and a bat's not exotic to me, but some people make bat soup, I guess, with it. The point I want to make is this. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, the serpent is called a beast of the field. Now, we would never call a serpent a beast. We'd call it a reptile. But it has reference to a living thing that creeps upon the earth. Now, I want to read from the Apocalypse a very strange verse of Scripture. When the Lamb of God breaks the seals in heaven, and it says this, I looked and behold a pale horse. And that, that word there, pale in Greek, is chloros, which means a pale green. And his name that sat upon him was death. And hell followed him. And power, or authority, was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. That's war. Hunger. That's famine. And remember, that's in Matthew 24, wars and rumors of wars and then famines. And watch this, and with death and with the beast of the field. Now, I want to key up on the phrase, the beast of the field. Death occurs in this instance over one part of the earth with either war or famine or with the beast of the earth. Now, the beast in Greek here is a Greek word that means a dangerous animal. Now, here's what's happening. If you will begin to pay attention to this, many of the viruses that have emerged the past 15 to 20 years are coming from what we call the beast or the animals of the earth. I call them animal flus or animal viruses. For example, the black, the black death, which was, which was known as the bubonic plague, hit from 1337 to 1351, and it originated, of all places, in China. Asia was very greatly affected, and they believe it came from rodents or specifically rats. And the fleas would get on the rats and then carry it to the other people. Now, the West Nile virus was spread by mosquitoes by a bite on the skin. Now, think about the animals. The swine flu came from pigs, from a pig Ebola. Millions of pigs were wiped out and killed as a result of it. The bird flu came from a waterfowl. They killed millions of chickens, especially in China. And uh, the coronavirus is believed to have come from a wild animal, such as a rat or a bat. And again, I'm not the person to say that. I'll let the specialists deal with that. But it's real interesting that God in the Old Testament says don't eat certain types of foods, and he knew what he was saying. He knew that they had viruses. He knew that they could carry uh, toxins that would be dangerous to the human body. Even when Israel ate quail in the wilderness in the book of Numbers, the Bible said that while it was in their teeth, they began to die. Three uh, thousands of Israelites died because quail fell in the camp and they were eating it. And the problem is if you don't, uh, you know, freeze meat or know how to deal with meat or eat it immediately when you uh, have an animal that, you know, let's say deer hunters or whatever, and they know what to do with animals like that when they, when they eat deer uh, or they eat uh, venison, whatever the case is, is a better way of saying it. Uh, if you don't do it right, you will get sick and you could actually die. Even shellfish was the same way. Israel did not let, uh, um, God did not let Israel in the Torah eat shellfish because if, if, you don't, if you don't refrigerate it properly, you can get bacteria, for example, in oysters, and people have died from that. Now, stop for a moment as we talk about the virus coming from the beast of the field because it says in Revelation, a verse I've never understood before, the beast of the field will cause death on the earth 
over a fourth of the landmass. And uh, that means actual number of people dying. Now, I'm not telling you, and I want to make this clear because I'll deal with this on another program, that we're in the tribulation because we're not. We're in the birth pains, and I'll deal with that on another program. But here's something else that's interesting. In the Middle East recently, there was a, uh, a cycle of very severe locusts, and this cycle was so bad that in parts of Africa, it was the worst locust invasion in 70 years. It was even called by secular news media people apocalyptic in nature. In in Somalia and Ethiopia and Kenya and even Uganda and all those parts of area er, areas of uh, Africa, uh, in 30 seconds these locusts would swarm as big as uh, as big as New York City. I mean, they would come into an area and in 30 seconds eat literally tens of thousands of acres of crops, and it created a famine in certain areas. In Ethiopia, they ate the tea leaves, and of course, this is part of where their money comes from, is from tea. It also ate many of the coffee uh, leaves and things connected to coffee, and it destroyed 30% of the exports just in Ethiopia alone. In Africa, in minutes, they ate enough, these locusts ate enough uh, food to feed 35,000 people just in one particular area. Now, locusts in the Bible, and we can go to Psalms 103, 34 through 35, can be considered a selective judgment that comes to a particular nation. This is what the Bible says. He spoke and the locusts came and caterpillars without number and did eat up all the herbs in the land and devoured the fruit of the ground. Now, this is interesting because it's talking about the land of Egypt and the locust invasion that came, which was part of one of the 10 plagues there in Egypt. Now, I want you to notice something that's very interesting, and we're going to focus on the one nation, which is China. You've seen numerous earthquakes in China. We now know that the coronavirus and the other viruses in the past, with the exception of Ebola and a few others, SARS, etc., originated in China. We also know that the locusts that left Africa went to the border of China. They were more prepared because they would take uh, geese and other animals that would eat locusts and they start turning them loose. So they had an ability to help prevent perhaps a great um, famine in parts of the border of China. Now, I'm going to make a statement here and I want everyone to follow me very, very carefully. Because if you know anything about the nation of China, they have persecuted not only poor people, but they have literally a persecuted arrested, tortured, and martyred so many Christians that only God in heaven knows how many Christians in China have been arrested, tortured, and martyred. This is a very, very strong, dominant communist country where dictators for many, many years have ruled. In fact, in China, they have indoctrination camps that Christians are sent to and try to actually cause them to change their way of thinking. I know stories from people that have come out of that area where you would not believe the starvation to Christians in prisons and jails and camps, the torture, tortures that this, this nation has done to tens and thousands and actually millions of its people over, over many, many years. Now, here's what's interesting, and I want to say this to you, and I want to be careful in saying it, but I want to say this to you. Some of the nations that are being heavily affected by this are nations where Christianity is the predominant religion. Like Italy, the majority of people, of course, are Roman Catholic in Italy. There are other groups of Christians. There are Baptists and Pentecostals and Charismatic, but the predominant group would be uh, Roman Catholic uh, background. In South Korea, in some of the areas of South Korea, South Korea has been known, especially in the area of Seoul, South Korea, as a very strong Christian area with churches with, with 50, 100, and uh, 1,000 more members. And Dr. Uh, Cho had a church that was just enormous and exploding with growth and so many people being saved. On the other hand, there have been nations like China and even Iran that is suffering greatly because of what is happening. Now, the point I want to make about all of this is this. This is where the scripture comes in where Jesus says, it rains on the just and the unjust. In other words, if a tornado comes through a town, it's amazing how the meanest guy in town's house is still standing, but the pastor's house got the roof tore off. Same thing with floods. It's amazing how the beer joint survived in Mississippi, but the church was flooded. Now, the point is simply this. When we come into these seasons of birth pains that we are now in, 
we have to understand that in birth pains, everybody who's living on the earth will be impacted one way or another by the birth pain. Now, what do we mean by birth pains? In the Old Testament, it deals with the appearing of the Messiah. In other words, there is a birth pain and a birthing pain that occurs, and then the person or the man-child is born. Now, I want to go back for just a moment to talk about uh, the area of China. China has probably somewhere, and this is an estimate, in the neighborhood of 100 million persecuted Christians. Some have been slain, some have jailed, some tortured, and absolutely they have been abused. Now, it's real interesting in these communist governments in the past that if, the, if you will go with the state church and they recognize you where they control everything you do, they control your message, they control what you do, you have a little bit of freedom. But if you're not willing to do that and you're willing to do like the early church saints and you're saying, we're going to follow Jesus and him alone, great persecution comes. Now, I'm going to ask you a question based on a couple of scriptures. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, there are martyrs under the throne of God in heaven. And these martyrs ask this question to the Lord. Revelation 6, 10, how long do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Remember Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me those who do not believe in God who are atheists, those who do not believe in the inspired Word of God. And this is a word that the judgment will come later on. Now, there are times that God wants to allow a judgment to come on evil, wicked leaders. Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapter 19 and Isaiah were told that the Assyrians were coming and the king of the Assyrians was going to absolutely take over and annihilate the city of Jerusalem. The king dug a tunnel of water to bring the water inside the city called Hezekiah's Tunnel, which exists to this day in Israel. Hezekiah had already paid tribute from the temple treasures of gold from the temple, even peeling the gold off the doors, to try to pacify the king that was coming called Sennacherib and 185,000 men. Sennacherib mocked God and said, no God from any nation has saved them from me. There's no God of anybody that exists that can stop my invasions. And who is your God? Well, the Bible says that they encamped that night before Jerusalem and in the morning, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were dead. Now, it's real interesting that when you look at this, we find in 1 Chronicles 21, 15, that David disobeyed God and a plague came to Israel and 70,000 men in Israel died, 1 Chronicles 21, 15. This is called the destroying angel or the angel of destruction, the same one that impacted Egypt in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 23. Now Herodotus, who was an historian, said this, that the, Assyri the Syrian army when they were in Egypt was overrun by mice. So in other words, it appears that when the Syrians got to Jerusalem that they had been infected, the whole army, by a plague that had been caused by rats. This would be similar to the bubonic plague that spread through the entire uh, world, uh, most of the world, I should say. And so it's interesting that in this example, here is an example of what we call beast of the field bringing a virus that literally wiped out an entire army. Now, it's important to understand that when God allows what we call a selective judgment to come, he always judges the gods of the nation. I quote, and they built a high place, the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fires of Moloch, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. And now therefore thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel concerning this city, whereof you say it shall be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon by the sword, by the famine, and watch this, by pestilence. Now it's interesting to note that when you look at what caused the judgment on Jerusalem. It was the shedding of innocent blood and the worshiping of Moloch of offering the children into the fire. In Matthew 23, the judgment came to Jerusalem because of shedding innocent blood. Joel 3:19 predicted that the city would be left desolate. Egypt had 10 idols, and this is what God says. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment, for I am the Lord. Here's my point that I want to make. Some of these nations that are atheistic and communistic have a God, not the true God, but their God is money and business. And when the Almighty allows a selective judgment to come, He attacks the God of that nation and allows that fake false God to suffer. That's only a thought that I want to kind of leave with you at this moment. Now, in a selective judgment, 
uh, whether it's a global judgment or a regional judgment, there's three things that can happen. Number one, you can escape it. Uh, in other words, God allows you to escape it by protection. Number two, you can endure it and you have to have patience. And this is where the American people are lacking. We have no patience. We've not had to have patience. Everything is do this, do that, get it done. Or number three, you will be preserved and protected in it while it's taking place. Years ago, John G. Lake was in South Africa and the bubonic plague was breaking out and there were bodies everywhere and nobody wanted to touch the bodies and bury them. This true story, by the way, it's in his uh, biography. And so what happened was he and a member of his church decided to bury the bodies and, and they began to bury the people, but they were not catching the plague. And doctors and scientists were very amazed at this. So Lake said this, go get the saliva off of the person that just died, put it on a, on a glass slide, put it under your microscope and make sure the germs are alive. And they did. They put the glass plate on his hand. He rebuked it in the name of Jesus. They said, now look at it. And all of the viruses and the germs and the, that were affecting the individual died on that slide. They did this several, several times because nobody could believe it. And John G. Lake made this statement. And it's a statement that we need to know during the coronavirus. The law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For you saints who are totally fearful, you've got to get in the word. Psalms 91 is a good example. You've got to believe the word. You've got to stand on the word. You've got to speak the word. And most of all, don't let fear get into your heart. Because the Bible said, perfect love casteth out fear. When you become fearful, you're showing God, I don't know that you love me and I don't know you care about me. But when your love is prefer perfected with God, you say to yourself, you know what? God knows everything that's happening. He knows I'm his child. He knows my name is in the Lamb's book of life. Therefore, I will not fear what man, plagues, or anything else can do unto me. And I hope this has helped give you some understanding on this particular subject. Now, for the next two weeks, I'm going to be going back with some other prophecies, but listen to me very carefully. One of the most significant offers that I've ever offered on Manifest is coming your way. Please order this immediately. It will bless you and encourage you and teach you things you did not know before. I'll be back in just a moment, so stay tuned. 20 years. It is a place that's a military memorial located in what is called the Golan Heights. In the biblical time, in the time of Joshua and Moses, this area was known as the Bashan. It is located in the northern part of Israel, not far from the border of Lebanon and Syria. For the next few moments, I want to give you a very important message to help you have understanding. That is not political understanding, but spiritual understanding as it relates to things that we see and the things that we read, not only in the Bible, but also throughout history. And the question I wish to pose to you is simply this. Why have there been so many battles from the very beginning of time in what is known as the Holy Land? Now, by definition, the Holy Land would be the land that is found written in the stories of the Bible. And predominantly, if we start in the book of Genesis, the latter part of Genesis, and we come all the way into the book of Malachi, and then we come into the New Testament, that land would be today called the nation of Israel. Now, in the times from, let's say, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Romans renamed the land the word that we use, Palestine. And in 1948, up until 1948, from the time of the destruction of the temple to 1948, this land was known as Palestine. However, after the Holocaust, the United Nations gathered together and they voted to partition the land of Palestine and create the nation of Israel. There are many people who are Palestinians that believe that this nation of Israel is a modern creation. It is not. It is actually the rebirth of a nation that existed in ancient time. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people uh, from the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had possession of this land. And throughout history, through wars and battles, it exchanged hands. And somehow today, through a miracle, actually, the people who originally owned the land, the descendants of Abraham, are back in the same land that was promised to them in a covenant. Which now leads me to a story that I want to tell you from the Bible. You know, in the land, which we now today call Israel, the land of Israel has been noted throughout history of having numerous wars. In fact, so many wars, it's almost difficult to count and keep up with. And the question I would like to pose to you today is, why is it that this land has been so fought over through history? And why is it still being fought over today? 
Now, the answer is not a simple one. It actually is not a political answer, nor is it really a political solution. The answer is a spiritual warfare that deals with the powers of darkness and the power of God, or as the Qumran Scrolls said, and the Essenes identified it as the war between the sons of darkness and the war between the sons of light. One of the first battles to ever happen in the Holy Land or here in Israel was the battle that Abraham had to fight with 318 men to recapture Lot, the goods, and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. There were five kings that came all the way from this territory which was the territory of Mesopotamia, the territory that we know of as, as, as ancient Babylon. And they came across these valleys that you're looking at here into the land south of the Dead Sea. And they captured an entire city and took all of its wealth and its people. But Abraham, God's covenant man, took 318 trained men on camels and met these kings and recaptured all of the possessions recaptured Lot and his family and the people and brought them all the way back to the city of Jerusalem where Abraham offered tithe to the first king and priest of the Most High God in Genesis 14 named Melchizedek. Now from that moment on we read throughout history that the children of Israel would possess the land and in the book of Joshua and Judges we discovered that after the Egyptian captivity, the Israelites came back to this land and the 12 tribes, which were the descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob, began to be given allotments of territory of which they and their children and their ch children's children after them could live and dwell in the land. But something began to happen. Something began to happen in the form of what were called tribes. Now in the Bible, I pre in fact, I, I preached a message from this many years ago called Smite the Ites, I-T-E. Yes. You'll find all of these different tribes, seven of them actually, that had the ending of the name Ite, the Hittite, the Moabite, the Amorite. And you have these particular tribes that were coexisting in the land. Now there was a problem with Israel trying to coexist with the people, not because of the people themselves, but because of the gods that those people were worshiping. God had said to the children of Israel, now when you come into the land, you have to dispossess the people that are there for one reason. They are idolaters. They worship false gods. And if you don't remove them and relocate them somewhere else, then the land that I call holy will become unholy because you will begin to follow the gods of the other nations. And the Lord said to them in this warning, their gods shall be a thorn in your side and scourges in your eyes. What does that mean? Your eyes are where you receive understanding, that the eyes of your understanding may be open, Paul said. And of course, your hips or your legs are how you walk. So God was saying to them, using the eyes and the legs and feet as an example, if you mix with the pagans and the idolaters, and you don't just take them from your promised land and allow them to go to another location, and be themselves and do their thing, then their gods will be a snare to your walk and to your understanding of me. And that's exactly what happened. Israel began to intermingle with the other tribes and sometimes they would intermarry the people of the other tribes. And someone said, well, what was so bad about the intermarriage part? Well, here was the problem. And this is what God understood that Israel really in the earliest days of its history did not understand. Genesis 3.15, the Lord promised that a Messiah would come and crush the head of the enemy. And that Messiah had to come from a, a particular lineage. Abraham, I'm sorry, Adam begat Seth, Seth begot Enos, Enos begot Canaan, Canaan begot Mahalalel, Mahalalel begot Jared. And then you talk about Enoch, who was the seventh from Adam. And you talk about Enoch, and you talk about Methuselah, and you talk about uh, Noah. You've got ten generations from Adam till Noah. And it, it says about Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of God and Noah was perfect in his generation. Now after the flood, there are three sons who helped repopulate the earth, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It would be through Shem's lineage and generation after generation after generation, Shem's lineage would eventually settle into this land, which was called originally Canaan land. It was called Canaan land because a group of people called the Canaanites lived here. And Canaan was a son of Ham or a grandson of Noah, whose descendants all settled in what today is known as the nation of Israel. In fact, if you'll study history, you'll discover that Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar 
are five cities that existed in Abraham's days. Four, four of them were wicked and were destroyed at the judgment in Genesis chapter 19. Zoar, the little city, was spared. And these cities were named after the descendants of a man named Canaan, who was the grandson of Noah, who was the son of Ham. So in other words, Canaan land received its name from a descendant of Noah. Shem's lineage is supposed to have resettled in this territory among other nations surrounding it. And this lineage of Shem is very interesting because many rabbis and Jewish scholars who have studied this in detail believe that Melchizedek of Genesis 14, Melech and Zadok, the king of righteousness, who was the king of Salem, which was actually the city of Jerusalem in its earliest days, that he was actually Shem, the righteous son of Noah, who, by the way, from the genealogy, would still be living in the time of Abraham. So my point is simply this, that Abraham's descendants, Isaac and Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob, settled this land, and here's the reason why. And here's where the story and the plot thickens. The reason they settled this land is because God gave to Abraham a covenant. And that covenant was made at an altar right up on the mountains behind me in the distance that you cannot see. And God said to Abraham, everywhere that your feet touch, I will give it to you and your descendants after you. And I will give you a son. And through this son, the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, here's the point. This land that we today call Israel is important to God because he made a covenant and he, the Bible said in the book of Romans, God could swear by no higher when he made the covenant. So he did what? He swore by himself. He swore by himself, meaning that, that God literally could, do, could do, do nothing any greater than say, I will keep my word. And if I don't keep my word to Abraham, I'm willing to destroy myself. That's actually what swearing by yourself means. Now, here's the thing I want to say. The land here throughout history has fought numerous battles. Let me go through some quick ones for an example. The Jews did not keep the Jubilee. They did not keep, let the land rest the way God said every seven years. So the Lord allowed them to go into 70 years of Babylonian captivity. This was in the time when Jeremiah was living. And of course, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were some of the great men of Judah from the king's lineage, actually from the priestly lineage, they were taken captive into Babylon. And you can read their story in the book of Daniel throughout those 12 chapters there in that great Old Testament book. But here's what I want to say about that. The reason God allowed Israel to go into captivity and he allowed the Babylonians to invade the land, to invade Judea, and then finally invade Jerusalem and destroy it was because the land did not keep its Sabbaths. So God said, okay, in Leviticus, I told you I would punish you seven times. There are 10 commandments and you've broke all 10 of them. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply the 10 commandments, seven times punishment and send you into captivity for 70 years. And that's exactly why Israel and all the tribes went into captivity for a period of 70 years. But then God brought them back. But it would be centuries later between the year 66 and 70 AD that the Roman 10th Legion, actually there were three legions involved, but it was the 10th Legion that did most of the destruction, came to the city of Jerusalem and they cast a trench around the city, which was a fulfillment of a prophecy of Jesus. And then the Christians were warned by an angel of the Lord, according to the early church fathers, to get out of Jerusalem and flee. And they did. They came to Jordan, which is in this area to on the right of your screen. And they went to a city called Pala where they received asylum by Herod and they developed a very strong Christian community after the destruction of the temple. Now the Romans came and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem. They burnt the temple and they toppled the stones because of the gold that was dripping there. And that was in the year 70. And in 71 AD, they did something else. They literally took salt and plowed all the area of Jerusalem over because once you put salt in the ground, it keeps plants from growing. And they changed the entire name of the city of Jerusalem to remove the memory of it from the Jewish people and from history. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from that moment on, Jerusalem and the area of Israel, and of course, then it was called Palestine after the destruction of the temple, this area endured battle after battle. And some of the worst battles happened between the Muslims and a group of men called the Crusaders. 
and the Crusaders would come in with their armies and they would seize Jerusalem and then the Muslims would come in with their armies and they would take it back. And these were called the Crusades. And it was a terrible time of bloodshed, a terrible time of fighting, a terrible time of battle. And I'm telling you, the land became filled with blood, especially in the area of the Galilee and more, more than that, the area of Jerusalem. And so I, I wanted to know, and, and I know that in 1948, Israel was restored as a nation through a UN decree. I know that in 1967, during a six day war, and these tanks that you're looking at behind me go back to that time frame. You see tanks up on the hill. These are tanks here. And these particular tanks were used in that battle. But in the 1967 war, something strange happened. Israel gained back the Sinai Desert. Israel gained back the Golden Heights and Israel gained back the area from Jordan that was the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan called the West Bank. Jerusalem was divided between Israel and Jordan and they, the Israelis came in, the Israeli government, and they annexed East Jerusalem with West Jerusalem and made it the capital of the nation of Israel. But here's the question that I want to go back to and I want you to think about this. Ponder this with me for a moment. Why is it that this area has had so many wars? Why have there been so many battles? Can I say something to you? Now let's look at this logically and rationally. This is a bunch of rock. This is a bunch of dirt. These are a bunch of mountains. Oh yes, it's beautiful and it can be used for farming land. And you have Jordan, the Jordan River, which is a water source. But outside of the water source and outside of farming, why would people for centuries kill each other over this land? I'd like to tell you, you listen to me now, it's not political. It's spiritual. And the reason that it's spiritual is it goes back to the covenant. Satan himself, the fallen angel, the prince of darkness, knows this. He knows that God made a covenant with Abraham that he cannot break, that Abraham's descendants would possess this land, that in the last days they would make this land prosper, that they would have farms. Read Isaiah chapter 35. It talks about it. Read Isaiah 27, that Israel will fill the world with fruit. That was written by Isaiah well over 2,700 years ago when this was a, a desert, when there was not much here. The point is this, and I don't want you to miss the point. If Satan, the fallen angel, could ever prove God Almighty, Yahweh, a liar, if he could ever approach the throne of God and said, you said this by a blood covenant, and you have broken your rules by the blood covenant, then Satan could actually, now I know this is going to sound theologically crazy, but it goes back to God swore by himself a covenant. If God were to break it, and this is all from rabbinical thought, then God would have to step down of, uh, from his throne and leave it alone and leave it empty because he would have broken his word. And we know the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not spoken and shall he not make it good? Hath he not said it and shall he not bring it to pass? So therefore, if God who cannot lie is ever caught in a lie and Satan can prove it, it means that God has broken his covenant. Now, how important is that? It's this important that God's not going to break his covenant, that Satan knows God will not break his covenant. How do you think that the city of Jerusalem that has had battles and exchanged hands 54 times, been destroyed two times, and had internal warfare 21 times, how do you think it's still the capital of Israel? Nobody on the planet, no city on the planet can brag of that. It's supernatural. That's the only way you can explain it. The fact that this nation is here after the Holocaust, when one third of the Jewish people of Europe are annihilated, and yet it's populating today, the technology is great, one of the greatest armies in the world, how do you explain it? Because the prophets of the Bible declared by the word of God and the mouth of God and by the covenant of God, it would come to pass. So here's my point. The reason the enemy is going to bring forth a tribulation First of all, the wrath of God will come because of sin, iniquity, and the shedding of innocent blood. So the tribulation in Revelation is partially about the wrath of God. But in Revelation 12, it says, Satan comes down with great wrath, knowing he has but a short time. Here's my point. At the end of the age, a man called the Antichrist will arise from the Middle East. He will have 10 kings with him according to the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. One of the things they will do is make a false treaty with Israel, then break that treaty, and in the middle of the seven, move a massive army into the nation of Israel and literally take over part of the city of Jerusalem. This is all found in the book of Zechariah. It will be, now pay attention, another attempted holocaust. 
It will be the attempt of Satan himself to do two things. Number one, annihilate completely the Jewish people. And number two, to take over the city of Jerusalem and ensure that the covenant people of Abraham, which are the Hebrew people, have no access or no control over the city. And the Bible says the Gentiles, and these are the, this is the Antichrist and his armies, will trample the city down for 42 months. Jesus said, except the days be shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for his elect's sake, the days would be shortened. Daniel said in Daniel 12, it will be a time of trouble such as was there, there was not a nation, nor ever shall be again. This is called the tribulation. But why is it there? From the perspective of the enemy, he is trying to do away with the last Jewish person. Why? Because if he could be successful, he can prove God's covenant a lie. If he can remove the Jewish people permanently from the land, he can prove God's covenant a lie. If he can take over the city of Jerusalem, where it's no longer in the hands of the seed of Abraham, he can prove God a lie and thus, by default, become the God of this world. Ladies and gentlemen, I've already read the end of the book, and I can tell you that is not how it's going to end. The Messiah, according to Zechariah 14 and Revelation 19, will return in the heat of Israel's trouble. And he will, according to Isaiah, save the tents of Judah first. Then he will go to the area of Jordan, which has escaped the hand of the Antichrist, according to Daniel 11, and rescue the remnant that's hidden in Petra. And then the Messiah will step foot on the Mount of Olives, and he will set up his kingdom. And that's when Satan and every angelic, demonic power with him is going to be bound for a thousand years. So, yes, have there been wars through history? Certainly. Why have there been wars to disrupt a covenant that God made and sealed with Abraham on these mountains at Bethel, here at the entrance of the promised land, in the city of Jerusalem, Genesis chapter 22, where he offered Isaac. But that, that blood of those animals, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sins. And under the old covenant, it was the shedding of the blood of the animal sacrifice. That blood is soaked somewhere, long deteriorated, but it still speaks up from the land that God has a covenant with his people. And guess what? If you're a believer, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, and you know the Messiah, you're going to come back with him in Revelation 19 and rule for those 1,000 years. So the bottom line is this. The biggest battles... One of them is called Armageddon, called the mother of all battles, is yet to come. But I know the end of the story. And it turns out good for those who know their God and know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and have believed on the Messiah who we know is the Lord Jesus Christ. So coming to you from this area, the Bashan and the Golan Heights, the land of the ancient giants, I've come by with good.